Did Fortnite just make the Holocaust into a video game? Is a hit and run exposing a massive racial divide in Israel? And speaking of divides, we're doing a deep dive on the Israel versus Judah debate. We're covering all that and more in today's episode, so let's unpack this all. By the way, how awesome is the sign, Today Unpacked? It's pretty amazing. If you subscribe, you will get a Today Unpacked t-shirt. Subscribe, share, like, you do all these things, you get a Today Unpacked shirt. And my producer, Ellie Stateman, will make sure that you get it. French-British game designer Luc Bernard has stirred up controversy over the light in the darkness, a Holocaust storyline he designed within the Fortnite universe. For those of us living under a rock, Fortnite is a wildly popular online video game with many different modes. Users can actually influence the landscape of the game and people love it. Bernard's game follows a Jewish family from pre-war Europe all the way to their inevitable deaths at the hands of the Nazis. And unlike other video games, there's no way to win. Bernard has stated that this was by design. I didn't want to make it seem like people in the Holocaust had a choice. It was all pure luck, the people who managed to live. Organizations like the ADL are skeptical of the project, saying that anti-Semitism is already rampant on platforms like Fortnite, and this will only increase opportunities for casual slurs and Holocaust desensitization. However, Bernard and many of the hundreds of thousands of players who completed the game argue that as online gaming becomes the most popular form of entertainment, it's critical to have a resource there for people who otherwise wouldn't learn about it. Bernard himself grew up disconnected from his history and would find out later that his grandmother actually helped Jewish children escape the Nazis through the kinder transport and changed her last name several times after the war to conceal her past. Fascinated by her story and others like hers, he pursued his passion to bring Holocaust education into the gaming world. While his vision and motives were clear, another question to consider is whether or not a video game targeted at young children is the appropriate venue for a virtual Holocaust museum. To this, Bernard says, this is not meant to be like going to Yad Vashem, right? We're all about meeting kids where they are. They are online and that's okay, let's teach. Kind of hear it. While for some generations Yad Vashem and Schindler's List have been instrumental vehicles in Holocaust education, and that's a wonderful thing, maybe the way the next generation learns about the atrocities of the Shoah, of the Holocaust, will come about not through the history books, but through the Xbox. What do you think? Is Bernard's game the appropriate venue for Holocaust education? or is it disrespectful to the memory of the millions lost? Do you think this will help raise awareness or become a vehicle for more online hate speech? Let me know in the comments below. Next, a protest was held on a main highway in Tel Aviv last week in memory of Rafael Adana, a four-year-old Ethiopian boy who was killed in a hit and run in Netanya last May. Tragically, Rafael died from his injuries a few days after the accident. In the US, a hit and run resulting in death carries a sentence of up to 30 years in prison with a minimum sentence of four years. Should be similar elsewhere, right? In this case, not so much. The woman driving the car was put on house arrest with no additional charges filed. This obviously did not go over well in Rafael's community and civil unrest ensued. The protesters who were primarily Ethiopian claim that the lenient sentencing the woman received was not enough. And another example of the racial inequality within Israel. Segem Malaku, a lawmaker of Ethiopian heritage said at the protest, there is no equality before the law. This country has a caste system. Rafael's father, who was walking with him at the time of the accident, said if his name was Rafael Hessian or Rafael Rubenstein, there probably would have been an indictment already. This statement from Rafael's father strikes a familiar and unfortunate chord in Israeli society, which is that Ethiopians and non-Ashkenazi, I mean Jews not from Europe originally, are often perceived as either second-class citizens or less than Jews. Now let's be clear. Every single country struggles with racial inequalities, and Israel is an example of a country like any other country in this regard. This incident raises lots of questions and more questions than answers about both Israel's legal process and the ongoing racial divide. If this really was an honest mistake committed by an elderly woman, should it really dictate the rest of her life? Or is intent irrelevant when an accident leads to death? And do you agree with Raphael's father that the sentence would have been stricter if Raphael belonged to a different community. Let us know what you think in the comments. I'm fascinated to know how you feel about this. Finally, we're talking about another splinter in Israeli society today. No, not that splinter. I'm talking about the age-old debate of Judah versus Israel. What's that? I'll tell you. We gotta rewind 3,000 years or so. The land we now call Israel was split into two kingdoms after the death of King Solomon. For many years, these two kingdoms had quite the tenuous relationship. The tribes of Israel were like Game of Thrones. 
full of rivalries, wars, and even a kingdom split between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. But guess what? More than 2,951 years later, the drama's not over. The Jewish people are still trying to figure out how to keep the peace. Flash forward to Theodor Herzl, the father of modern political Zionism, who published a book about Israel called the Judenstaat, which could either mean the Jewish state or the Jew state. So let's say it means a Jewish state as opposed to the Jew state. The question is whether the rhythm of the country should be more publicly governed by Jewish law, with individuals still free to practice their faith as they wish. On the other side of this philosophical issue, those in Camp Israel believe the land should be composed of many Jews, yes, infused with Jewish culture, yes, but public decisions not governed by Jewish law. With the Israel side, they see the state as a land that belongs to the Jewish people. Like Albert Einstein also believed, a refuge for all Jews regardless of religious affiliation. While this debate has gone back and forth for millennia, it's starting to resurface in a very real way. If you've turned on any news in Israel over the last several months, then you know there have been large, lively protests opposing Netanyahu's judicial reform legislation to limit the ability of Israel's Supreme Court to block new legislation passed by Israel's parliament, the Knesset. In other words, the opposition to the new law sees the limiting of the Supreme Court's power as a barrier to maintaining checks and balances and therefore heavily favors the dominant parties. And because Netanyahu represents Likud, the religiously affiliated parties of the Israeli government, secular Israelis fear that the Western model of democracy could potentially crumble and be transformed into some form of a theocracy. Now that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but that's where the fear is. Enter the Tzan Amit, a 33-year-old resident of Givatayim. He founded the separation movement and cooked up a five-stage plan for mutual separation between New Israel and Judah, Judea. He's saying Israel's on the edge of an abyss and a division into two states, one liberal and the other more traditional religious, could be the way out. Big words, bigger vision. So what's the plan? New Israel gets the Golan Heights, Upper Galilee, and the coastal cities, Haifa, Netanya, Tel Aviv. Meanwhile, Judea takes over Jerusalem, Beersheba, the West Bank area, you know? This would require a ton of complicated logistics from forming covenants to establishing regional governments. You're probably wondering, what about Arab Israelis? Well, Nitsan's got an answer for that too. They'll get to choose their state and new Israel will be more like a federation than a dictatorship. A famous story that illustrates this divide is about two cooks in the Israeli army at the beginning of the founding of the state of Israel in 1948. These two cooks refused to cook and desecrate Shabbat. Their violation of orders created a moment in which Israel could have splintered into two different armies, two different movements. Well, David Ben-Gurion nixed that idea totally, famously stating, Israel will continue to be one nation and its army will be one army. Many of these issues are still relevant today, like the public transportation ban on Shabbat story we covered just last week, check it out. Ideological differences between the Israel and Judah camps are as evident as ever. In reality, while there are many Israels, there's only one Jewish people, made up of many types of people, with many communities. It is the diversity of thought and perspective that has driven Jewish culture and the Jewish state as far as it has. And by dividing ourselves, by dividing the Jewish people, we're putting our future as a people at risk. Would you want to live in a Jewish state that is run by Jewish law in a public sense, but in an individual sense not? Or a state that is open to new Jewish ideas that veer away from traditional Jewish law and practice in the public sphere? Sound off in the comments, what do you think about splitting up the country? Do you think it should be split up into Team Judah and to Team Israel? Or do you think that the Jewish people and the citizens of the state of Israel should all figure out how to live within one state? You tell me what you think. Fascinated to hear.